Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about psychographic targeting in political, political campaigns. Um, psychographic meaning using personality and behavior uh, to target uh, ads at specific groups of people. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about the title of the talk in a couple of slides. Um, but let me explain how we got into this uh, research and, and this particular talk. So in 2016, we did some research into the EU referendum, or some of you might know as uh, Brexit. Uh, we did six studies consisting of about 11,000 participants, and we looked at personality differences, difference in numeracy skills, uh, thinking styles, and cognitive biases. And in three of those studies, we added a question around if, can, you, can you all hear me? I guess. Uh, closer? Wow. I'll probably be eating it. But, um, okay, so in, um, in three of those studies with about 5,000 people, we added an additional question that uh, asked people's opinions as to how much they agreed on the nothing to, uh, nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument. So if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. And what we saw in that research was that People who voted to leave the European Union were much more likely to support the nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument than those who voted to remain. So we wanted to study that in greater depth to understand kind of what was, uh, what was going on there uh, and understand a little bit more about the drivers. Then in around January of uh, this year, some of my friends started pointing out um, articles like this which appeared in Scout.ai, and this is where we got the title of the talk from really. They introduced it as the rise of the weaponized AI propaganda machine, so using psychographic information in uh, political campaigns. So my friends weren't the only people who were beginning to sort of question the, the efficacy of, uh, you know, how well does this work essentially. Uh, other journalists started looking, you know, looking at that and saying, well, does this really hold water or, or not? So we've got a little bit of background uh, in this topic. In 2013, we presented at DEF CON on uh, predicting susceptibility to social bots on Twitter. So seeing which users would interact with a social bot based on their Twitter activity, uh, and we also looked at personality uh, in, in that. In 2011 and in 2012, we'd looked at determining personality through Facebook activity uh, and through Twitter. Both of those were presented at, at DEF CON also. So what we decided to do was use the, uh, using attitudes to online surveillance or digital rights, use that as like the central thesis for exploring the efficacy of psychographic marketing in political campaigns. So the rest of the talk is structured into uh, five main sections. First of all, we look at why people are divided. Then we move on to what influences their views, what nudges them sort of one way or the other. Then we look at once, we've, once we understand how people are divided, assuming they are, which spoiler alert, they, they are, um, how can you effectively target groups with differing attitudes in relation to online communication surveillance? Uh, once we know how we can target different users, or different people essentially, we look at um, how persuasive are targeted ads. And then finally we wrap up with looking at, okay, once a message is out there, how effective, how, how able are you to sort of debunk misleading information or misinterpretable information once it gets out of the gate? So on to the first question, looking at why people are divided. Well, we chose the nothing to fear, nothing to hide argument, but we could have chosen the, the, the death penalty, we could have chosen the topic of same-sex marriage, and we could have chosen uh, the topic of um, immigration. So what, uh, what seems to be at the center, or a, at least a, a major factor in all of these differing worldviews, is uh, something called authoritarianism which uh, began as a study in the, I guess, following the, the Second World War, uh, but lost some favor or some credibility in those early years and has regained credibility in more recent years, in the last few decades, essentially. Um, so authoritarianism, as you look at it, you might be forgiven for thinking it's a bimodal distribution with people either low or high and not a great deal in the middle. But what, we've actually, you know, what we actually find is that it, it's a much more skewed distribution than that, at least in uh, the Facebook samples that we, that we see. So what, uh, what characterizes authoritarianism is that people higher in authoritarianism tend to see the world in, uh, in sort of black and white. Uh, 
whereas people lower in authoritarianism see, tend to see it in sort of shades and shades of grey, really. And it's a sliding scale, you know. So people are. It's very rare to have people at certain extremes, essentially. People who are higher in authoritarian authoritarianism uh, have are more concerned about the upkeep of societal norms and traditions, whereas people lower in authoritarianism uh, are more embracing of new cultures, um, new ideas. So uh, the, the footloose image there. Uh, additionally, what we see is that those who are higher in authoritarianism have lower tolerance for outgroups, um, whereas people who are uh, lower in authoritarianism uh, are much more embracing of uh, different um, different cultures or you know different races and, and what have you. So the scales that we use through throughout our studies stem from some work by uh, researchers called Feldman and Stenner in 1997, where they developed uh, a very simple way of looking at authoritarianism. They developed a, a four question, uh, if you like, child rearing questionnaire. So. If, you're, um, if you select answers to these questions, which you, know, you have to select one or the other for each of the, the line items, if you're predominantly choosing answers on the right-hand side, uh, then you're, more, you're higher in authoritarianism than people choosing um, answers on the, the left-hand side. You know, generally, there's some exceptions to that. So moving on to our, our study, uh, and our results for the first thing of looking at why people uh, why people differ. You know, we, we chose authoritarianism to, uh, to 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 look at in greater depth. We conducted uh, four different studies uh, over well from February to uh, to May with differing sample sizes. You'll note that there's uh, studies A and studies B. There's a slight difference in 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 the uh, studies. All of the questions, all of the studies. Uh, took um, basic demographic information, age and, and sex, and they asked uh, a number of questions about people's attitudes to online surveillance, which we essentially replicated from prior studies or prior surveys so that we could actually go back and reference and see if our numbers were sort of consistent. The difference between studies B and A was that uh, the, the B studies also contained a numerical question, which we'll get to a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Because the studies differed, we treat them kind of individually as, as well. We don't group them uh, with, uh, with one exception. So we had about 2,400 people took part in those, those surveys, which we ran through Facebook. So the questions we asked were, uh, you have, how much do you, you know, do you agree? And it was a binary choice. The, the binary choice in the uh, question stemmed from work from uh, Professor Hetherington and Elizabeth Shuhei, who had looked at, uh, previously looked at uh, authoritarianism in American politics in 2011. So we wanted to try and replicate some of their work. So do you have nothing to fear? Uh, do you agree or disagree with you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to, you, you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide? So that was uh, the question to replicate our EU referendum work. Then the next question was, uh, it is acceptable that law enforcement agencies have the right to access the content of citizens' online communication without a warrant in order to uh, investigate terrorism? That question was from the, the Hetherington study. Then the next question we ask is, it is acceptable that immigrants and visitors from potentially dangerous countries should have to reveal their social media account passwords to UK border agents. So we, we use the, the UK sample set, but you can do this on a US sample set too. The next question, which came from a survey on attitudes to privacy in 2016, was simply the dark net should be shut down. I'm not quite sure how you do that, but... Um, but it comes from a survey. So we wanted to, we, you know, it gave me a chuckle, so we added that in. And the final question we asked was, companies should not be allowed to develop technologies that prevent law enforcement from accessing your online conversations. And that came from that same uh, privacy survey. So going back to our surveys, I mentioned that we treat them differently because uh, there were different, um, be, Studies B and A were, were slightly different, so we treat them different statistically. Uh, the other thing that happened was that in March, uh, late March, there was a terrorist attack in London, um, 
So what we wanted to do was, well, see what the effect was of the terrorist uh, attack to attitudes to online um, surveillance. And there's been previous work in that space. Uh, researchers have looked at differing attitudes before and after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in, in Paris. So what we see from the results of uh, surveys A1 and, and A2, the ones without the numeric question, is that uh, for most of the questions, you get around a sort of a 30, 30 you know, 30 percentish uh, agree with the, the statement. Uh, only one of those was statistically um, different before and after the attacks, and that was the sort of the banning the anti-surveillance technology uh, question. Uh, the rest, while it looks like there's a visual difference, or well, there is a visual difference, um, we didn't see a statistically significant difference between uh, opinions. Um, the thing that interested me or fascinated me the most about the results was that there was, um, you know, more support for shutting down the dark net. People just want to s shut that sucker down, essentially. Um, so, in looking at studies B1 and B2, uh, which were con the, the B2 study was conducted 41 days after the uh, attacks, we see that there's almost no difference in opinions uh, from before and after. So, the opinions sort of drop off after the, uh, after the terrorist attacks in, in those surveys. So we see broadly the, the level of support there is hover, hovers around the 30 percent, and we'll get, a little, we'll get to that a little bit more in the presentation. So looking at the role of authoritarianism in, uh, in these attitudes, when we look at the nothing to hide, nothing to fear question uh, in particular, we see um, you know, somewhere between a one and a half to a two and a half uh, times I increase between those who agree with the statement being more authoritarian uh, versus those who disagree with the statement. Uh, we also perform like, um, uh, uh, logistic regression, essentially, to look at plotting the odds and some other statistical methods, and we find the same differences you know, broadly through all of them. In terms of the, the other questions, we see sort of broadly similar results as well around wiretapping, shutting down the dark net, banning anti-surveillance technology, and extreme, uh, extreme vetting. So we see consistently, not just across the questions, but also between all of the different age groups and sexes, uh, that the, these opinions tend to, tend to be fairly consistent. So assuming that authoritarianism is more of a, a constant, what is it that can influence people's uh, differing views? So it's said uh, by a gentleman called Bob uh, Altemeyer who developed the, uh, what was called the right-wing authoritarian scale in 1996 that uh, authoritarians are characterized as being like 10 steps closer to the panic button. So we sort of plot that on, on this graph and show a, a, the blue line is essentially a, the, the baseline of support for, uh, for surveillance. Then there are uh, two streams of research that have looked at this previously. The first stream of research uh, by Feldman and Stenner had, uh, had essentially argued that uh, threat in, or the per perception of threat increases support among those who are higher in authoritarianism. So uh, the, the folks at the, the higher end of the scale there are going to support it more if they are more concerned about the threats of terrorism. Another stream of research by Hetherington and Suhey in 2011 found that threat increases support among those lower in uh, authoritarianism. So um, people at the high end didn't really change their opinion if something, um, you know, if they perceived the threat to be high, but those much lower more, were more likely to adopt an authoritarian position uh, if they perceived the threat to be high. Uh, the researchers that looked at the differences in uh, before and after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, looked at this and suggest that both are partly right, and that it's anxiety that's um, responsible for causing the uplift in those who are lower in authoritarianism if they are concerned about the threat of terror, uh, versus anger in uh, people higher in authoritarianism if they perceive the threat uh, of terror to be high. So in the study that we conducted, uh, what we've done in all of the studies, we had an, uh, a, a question that simply asked, uh, how worried are you that you might personally become a victim 
uh, of a terrorist attack. And that was coded, people could answer in like in four ways from like I'm not worried at all to yeah, I'm very concerned. And that replicates the work from Hetherington and Suhey. So what we did as we used a logistic regression, essentially uh, replicating Hetherington's work, um, plotting the probability of support for each of those questions against authoritarianism, and then looking at the effect of people's perception on, um, on threat. So Hetherington and Suhey's work, I figured I'd, I'd add this, so sorry about the, the bad quality photo from, uh, from Hetherington's book, but here you can see the effect that he was talking about Essentially, people lower in authoritarianism, you see that the support uh, really increases from about 25% of support on their uh, wiretapping question to about uh, 75, 80% uh, probability of support. And you'll see at the higher end of authoritarianism, there's really not a great deal of difference. So in our studies, in terms of the uh, nothing to hide, nothing to fear question, we see essentially a similar sort of effect happening to what uh, Hetherington and Suhey found. Um, so going from about an 18% probability of support for those who are not concerned um, and are low in authoritarianism, that jumps to about a 60% um, level of support. But there's not many in that category. Uh, and at the higher end, there's almost no difference. Looking at all of the other questions, uh, at least for wiretapping and banning anti-surveillance tech, we see similar sort of trend going on. Um, I'll talk about extreme vetting and shutting down the dark net shortly. So extreme vetting is, a, is an anomaly, but uh, Hetherington had seen that in, uh, or you know, seen a similar sort of uh, interaction in one of his other questions. So that needs more, more analysis, but I didn't want to shirk away from calling that one out. Uh, the other thing which uh, interested me was that you, here you see reflected the, the high level of support for shutting down the dark net, and you see how that jumps up, even from like a medium high, a very high level, you see the interactions so that if people are concerned about the threat of terror, you know, there's uh, broad support for uh, tackling the, the dark net. So okay, now we've looked at how people differ around the, uh, the disposition of authoritarianism, and we can see the role that uh, perception of threat has uh, on people's attitudes. Now we look at, okay, how can we target those different groups of people? How can we target people who are low in authoritarianism versus people uh, who are high in authoritarianism? So essentially, a lot of researchers looked at um, the relationship between age, sex, geography, Facebook interests, Facebook activity, and such like, and personality. What we want to be able to do here is almost get uh, personality, in our case, we use authoritarianism, put it through a function and get the age, sex, geography, and Facebook interests that uh, are gonna be most closely associated with people either low or high in authoritarianism. So if you like, we create two buckets. One bucket there for low authoritarian and one bucket for uh, high authoritarian. So onto the study and our, our findings. Uh, first of all, tackling age and sex. What we saw in the EU referendum studies was that the difference between female voters who voted to leave or remain in the EU had a much closer level of authoritarianism. There wasn't a great deal to separate them, and indeed looking at the results, there were very low percentages of females in the 18 to 35 age group who wanted to uh, leave the, the EU. We also saw that reflected in uh, the studies that we'd, we'd looked at here uh, it, with regards to um, the, uh, the nothing to fear, nothing to hide arguments online um, communication surveillance. You'll see that as females get older, the difference extends, so there is a starker difference, and that gets like more consistent with males. And for males, there was, uh, there was differences at every age. So in terms of the buckets that we created, and we created these buckets so that we could add them into the Facebook advertising audiences, uh, we have the low authoritarian groups of males of any age, but females only if they're under 35. And for the high authoritarian category, we use males of any age and th females who are 35 uh, and over. So that's our simple like, age and, and sex classification. And uh, it, it is you know, relatively simple, but um, as we see, it, it becomes quite effective. So for geography, 
Uh, Renfro and, uh, and other researchers have looked at regional differences in personality. These are maps of the United Kingdom, and the letters at the bottom reflect what's called the big five of personality. So you've got openness to experience, uh, which is you know, strongly correlated with creativity, conscientiousness, which is more concerned about some of the, the traditions and what have you, or relate or correlates with, with that. We've got extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So he's looked at different areas with a, a, a very large uh, sample set across the UK and found different regional, uh, regional differences. He's also done that with the United States as well, so if you're interested in those regional differences, you can check that out. So he's presented a, a lot of results and findings for each of about 300 different local area districts in the United Kingdom. So what we did is we mapped authoritarianism to the big five using uh, some meta-analysis from researchers Sibley and Duckett. And in terms of authoritarianism, it's classified, uh, or high authoritarianism is classified by higher degrees of conscientiousness and lower degrees of openness mostly. There was a slight difference in neuroticism, but we can you know, pretty safely ignore that. So for our research, what we did, we plotted openness on the uh, openness here, but we re reverse it. So we get low openness essentially um, uh, against conscientiousness. And then we take the results from Renfro's study of uh, over 300 areas in the UK, and we plot them on a graph that's a little bit like this. So you get the high authoritarians to the top right-hand corner, and you get the low authoritarians towards the, uh, the, the bottom left. And uh, since it's a hacker conference, it's quite interesting that the least authoritarian place in the United Kingdom is a place called Hackney in London. And I didn't make that up for the, for the talk. But, um, so we chose some towns um, that were most likely to be, in our opinion, high authoritarian, and some towns and cities that were most likely to be low in authoritarianism. We also looked at like, how many people were there for reach and stuff like that. Uh, so we had some other characteristics that we, we looked at. And the towns that we chose for low authoritarian were towns that most of you have probably heard of, Cambridge, Liverpool, Edinburgh, and now you've all heard of Hackney. Um, and in the high authoritarian town, we've got uh, high authoritarian uh, districts. We've got places like Basildon and Thurrock and Mansfield uh, and Swindon. You might have heard of Swindon if you like the game like my son does, The Amazing Frog and Pungence's YouTube channel. Other than that, I'm not sure that any of those towns are that famous outside of the United Kingdom. So now we've got a bucket for age and sex, and we've got the regions that we're going to use in our Facebook advertising. And incidentally, the results that we found using just a simple logistic regression were actually really good at correctly classifying the EU referendum vote. And we did the same thing when we looked at the regional differences in the US and predicting the, uh, the recent election that you guys had. So on to Facebook interests, there's a tool here called the preference tool uh, that's available to researchers where you use like slider bars, if you like, to put in uh, different effects of personality, and that shows you some of the Facebook interests that those groups use. Now, we did not use the preference tool because it's available only to, uh, to researchers, um, and we, did, we, we didn't need to do that really because we looked at some of the Facebook interests that we already knew were highly correlated with authoritarianism uh, and low authoritarians. So the low authoritarian category, we chose just simply the interest of liberalism, uh, which is a Facebook interest, and, um, and the Guardian newspaper, which I guess is similar to your Washington Post, I, I, I guess. Uh, for the high authoritarian category, we chose conservatism uh, and the Mail on, Online. I'm not sure what the equivalent U.S. newspaper is. So, as, so <laughs> somebody shouted something now, but I didn't hear it. So that's it. But um, so the, the baseline we've got to, to, to beat, if you like, is uh, the nothing to hide, nothing to fear argument. We had a, a sort of a baseline of 38% support for that particular argument in the studies that we use in this, this sample set. For the targeted audience, just based on uh, age, sex, and geography, we saw a drop from 38% to 22, uh, 32%, but it wasn't statistically significant. And we saw uh, 
an uplift in um, support for the high authoritarian towns from 38 to 46. Um, when we added the Facebook interests in that we looked at for the correlation to, uh, to, to authoritarianism, we saw that uh, we started to get significant results, although for the first group it was relatively low, possibly due to the overall skew to look towards low authoritarianism anyway. So from 38% agreement with the argument to 25 is not bad uh, for a very simple experiment. And in the high authoritarian category, we're adding in personality, we see the jump go from 38% to 61%, um, which was um, highly statistically significant. Uh, a quick note on the significance is that um, if, you, if I'm doing this in the wild, I might not be so interested or worried about P levels and stuff like that. If I consistently see the results like that, maybe I just take a gamble on it anyway and it might give me a sort of a higher return on my advertising investment. So okay, we've seen the differences in personality and we've seen how we can target different groups uh, based on just some um, simple factors that uh, uh, enable us to reach audiences with uh, significantly different views on online communication surveillance. But now we want to turn to, well, what about persuasive ads and, uh, and targeting of ads? So this is uh, Alexander Nix from Cambridge Analytica, and he states, and this video is on, online, if you know the personality of the people you're targeting, you can nuance your messaging to resonate more effectively with those key audience groups. So there's been some research in this space, this study by Hirsch Kang Bodenhausen. They looked at, they created five separate telephone uh, ads that were designed to appeal to different levels of the big five of personality. So this is the ad that they used, or at least this is the text that they used in an um, in ad that was aimed at uh, uh, extroversion. The X phone, with X phone you'll always be where the excitement is. And then for neuroticism, they have stay safe and secure with the X phone, and they always saw statistically significant differences. Uh, Matt Popov, Kaczynski, and Stilwell did a similar thing, looking at aiming ads towards introverts and extroverts uh, for beauty products, and they saw that indeed uh, targeting those ads based on, um, on uh, personality had a significant uh, effect on their click-through rates to the return on uh, advertising investment. So moving on to our study and results, what we did, we had ads that were aimed at um, people in the high authoritarian bucket and ads that were targeted at people who were in the low authoritarian buckets. And we split that into uh, to ads that are designed to be pro-surveillance and ads that are uh, designed to be anti-surveillance. So the first ad for pro was really appealing to, um, to the high authoritarian category as terrorists don't let them hide online. Um, so hopefully invoking some anger there. And for the low authoritarian group, we tried to uh, highlight that uh, there was more than just terrorism uh, online, and we had the tagline, crime doesn't stop where the internet starts. I, I know it's cheesy, but um, the, the thinking was that people would look at uh, a broader crimes like human trafficking and, trafficking and child exploitation. So for the uh, low authoritarian group, with the anti-surveillance message, we used the image of uh, Anne Frank, and we said, you know, do you really have nothing to fear if you've got nothing to hide? And for the high authoritarian group, we used an image of the D-Day landings um, appealing to uh, the authoritarian characteristics of um, affiliation with military and respect for elders. So those were the ads we categorized, and then in looking at the results of those ads, we uh, reference them here, and these are the self-reported levels of authoritarianism in people that took part in our surveys or samples to, um, to, to rate the ads. So they were asked a bunch of questions like, how much do you like the ad? Uh, the ad, how much does the ad re resonate with my beliefs? Uh, how persuasive is the ad? How likely am I to, to click like or share on the ad? That, uh, that kind of thing. And we split that then in people's self-reported um, self -reported groups. So this was, this, was, this was actually where the, where the uh, persuasiveness of the ad is rated, and that is, that is w what people's levels of authoritarianism were classed at, so high, medium, and low. Okay, so the performance of the high authoritarian ad, we see that people who are high in authoritarianism like the ad much more than people who are like medium and low. 
And when we move to the ad for the low authoritarian group, we see people who were high still like it. It's kind of bought in because they're, they're, they'd be more pro-surveillance uh, anyway. But we see then an uplift in the, uh, or the expected uplift in the low and medium, or we see an uplift in the low and medium authoritarian categories. So the ad seems to be having the, the sort of desired effect, if you like. For the low authoritarian category and anti-surveillance, we see kind of a reversal of the high uh, pro uh, ad, where people who are low in authoritarianism like it, and people who are high don't like it so much. Um, when we target the ad towards, or when we created the ads for um, the high authoritarian group, we see a similar sort of uplift to the one we got in the top right-hand corner. Um, and there's a broad level of uh, increase of support from those medium and high. So, so that's people's responses to how much they like the ad, and then we took it a step further and tested it in the wild with, um, with Facebook ads designed, uh, or actually they were Facebook posts, and we used the boosting in the Facebook advertising um, to appeal to those different, uh, those different audiences. So here we see the, the Facebook target audiences of high and low authoritarian. There's only two, two groups there from our target audience. And then um, the, the ads, in those um, boxes uh, relate to the ads that we, we just saw. So what we do for this, is, uh, using the, the, the Facebook advertising essentially, is then look at the click-through rates, or actually this is really the ratio of likes and shares by, uh, by the level of reach for uh, each ad. Um, so the numbers look pretty low, but actually um, you know, those are fairly consistent with click-through rates that you'd expect. So for the ad aimed at the high auth group, we see that as expected, people who are in high in, in authoritarianism like the ad, people who are low think it sucks. Um, in the low authoritarian ad, uh, there was a, a lot less traction altogether. And Facebook gives you forewarning. It basically says that you know, ads that have got a lot of text uh, do less well. You might want to consider changing your ad. But what I draw your attention to, at least, is that there was a, a, an expected difference in the sort of the, the correlation coefficient, if you like. So the, the, gap, uh, the gap reduces between the, the, the low and high. So if we move on to the low authoritarian ads uh, for anti-surveillance, we see the expected results that people in the low authoritarian target like the ad or interact with the ad much more than those in the high authoritarian or more than those in the high. But then what we see for the ad that's targeted at people in the high authoritarian, uh, 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 designed to appeal to people who are high in authoritarianism and anti, we still get a lot of people who are low in authoritarianism like it because they like the message of, I don't, you know, they don't like um, on, online communications events or the idea of it, but people higher then support it a lot more. That was kind of surprising to us. We, we, we thought we'd actually get more of a backlash from those, uh, those groups uh, rather than, uh, rather than the, the interaction. So again, we see that the correlation coefficient reduces as we'd have expected from the ads. But uh, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, that's well and good. We've seen how much people like and click on ads, but does persuasion actually work? You haven't actually told us that. Fair, fair comment, I haven't. Um, and there's very little research into, into that. But this research by um, researchers at the University of Mannheim in, in Germany, Junger, Wutker, and, and co., what they did is they uh, took people's attitudes to transatlantic trade, uh, and a sample set was large. It was about 8,000 people. And then they sent some of them some ads uh, explaining, or some uh, literature about the benefits of transatlantic trade. Um, and they found that over the, the baseline, which is the, the zero line, the, the control of people who didn't receive the literature, they found that people became more support, much more supportive after they'd, uh, of transatlantic trade after they'd received the, uh, the literature. And they looked at um, the differences in opinions shortly after receiving the literature and then some time after. And they did, no they did notice a drop off. Uh, in, in the time, but uh, you know, so suggests that if you're wanting to be get persuasive material out there, then time is of the essence. So okay, now we've seen, you know, you can get the message out there, but what if the the message is erroneous? So how would you go about sort of debunking propaganda? Well, to 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 this. Uh, well, it's not really how we go about debunking, it's what are the challenges of debunking propaganda. So for this, we turn to some research from 
Professor uh, uh, Dan Kahan at Yale University. He divided participants in his experiment into four categories, A, B, C, and D. For categories A and B, he gave them a numerical question about how well uh, skin cream does at treating a rash. Um, and he gave them a number grid which looks like this. So group A received uh, these, this number grid and were asked to, to say, okay, did skin cream um, essentially make the rash better or did it make it worse? And people had to go figure that out. Whereas group B, the text was uh, slightly changed, um, but the numbers remained the same. So the rash gets better or the rash gets worse. What they found is that people did roughly the same, uh, had roughly the same um, ability to answer the, the, the question. But when he changed the question to one about uh, does gun control reduce or increase crime, he found that uh, people's ideological beliefs really hampered their ability to answer the question. And I'll demonstrate that because we replicated uh, Kahan's study in our EU referendum work, but we changed the question from one of gun control to one about immigration increasing or decreasing crime. So here we see how um, how people do at the, the skin cream ad, if you like. So uh, broadly consistent, uh, just under 60% uh, getting it right in the referendum uh, result, leave versus remain. But when we ask about does immigration uh, decrease crime, people who voted to, to leave were just not having any of that and were unable to, to answer the question or their performance tanked, essentially. Whereas people who voted to remain, their performance uh, answering the question actually increased. Then when we switch it to immigration increases crime, then the leave voters start doing better again, um, but the remain voters' performance tanks. Uh, and the, the, the research that he's conducted is, is uh, termed ideologically motivated reasoning. And it was dubbed uh, in one article the most depressing brain finding ever. Uh, which I, I liked. And this study was from a, a little while ago, but it's pretty exciting. He's got a, a, a web page which you go check out called the Cultural Cognition uh, Project, and uh, it's well worth a, a read. So in our study, um, we sort of replicated that research again, but we used the, the, you know, the attitudes to online surveillance. So in the skin cream uh, ads, we see similar sort of trends between those who agree and disagree with the nothing to fear, nothing to hide argument. But then when we suggest that surveillance actually increases the threat of a terrorist attack, uh, then those who agree with the statement, their performance drops quite significantly, whereas those who disagree, their performance drops a bit. Um, and I'd suggest that the performance drops a bit because the numerical question is actually, the, the text in it is, uh, is actually harder to read than it was for the immigration and gun control. When we switch to uh, surveillance actually does decrease the threat, then we see the interaction reverse, although not as starkly as we did in the, uh, in the immigration campaign. We had a sample set of 15, 1,500. So we see the same sort of inter interaction, just not as starkly. Uh, however, the interaction does uh, seem to increase as people get older. Um, so you see uh, a more significant result as people get over 35 and here we just show 44 and over. So in terms of uh, wrapping, the, wrapping the talk up, what we've seen is that authoritarianism plays a part in why, why people differ uh, or why their opinions differ. We found that the perception of, of threat plays a part in actually influencing or nudging people from uh, a baseline position to a different position. Uh, we found that we were able to actually target people with different attitudes to online uh, surveillance uh, just by using uh, some simple knowledge about uh, the, the psychological traits associated with authoritarianism. Uh, we find that the persuasiveness of, of ads uh, does indeed um, seem to work and that challenging or, or tackling misleading information is gonna be a, a very challenging problem uh, because people's ability to, to, uh, to uh, interpret uh, evidence essentially uh, becomes a lot harder if it goes against their uh, existing beliefs. So a question I received um, recently was, okay, well, if both sides are using this, do the effects equal each other out? Uh, and I thought about that and thought, well, yeah, in, in theory, they sort of do uh, or could do. Uh, 
but there's uh, an, another potential theory is that it's possible that one side has a home team advantage essentially. Um, so one of the ways they'd have a home team advantage is, well, if you've got momentum on your side, um, then you can go with that and just like double down on it. So here we see the shutting down the dark net question um, and the level of support for it. Well, if you just go with that and just increase the, the, the already existing fears that people have, um, you, it's going to be a lot harder to be in the defense, uh, to, to defend that, uh, that argument than it is to attack the, the argument, if you like. Uh, there's also the, the role of, uh, of fear. So uh, if you've not seen it, there's a great video online by uh, Dee Madigan on propaganda. And Dee Madigan is a uh, Australian uh, campaign advertiser uh, and does a, a really fantastic talk. Uh, and she talks about the, the effect of fear-based advertising. And she, she says, yeah, um, people have said that or said to her that negative campaigns really suck and they don't work on me. And, she, and her comment was essentially that, um, yes, negative campaigns do work, and that's why we do them. Um, something like that, anyway, paraphrasing. But uh, the, the fear actually, uh, or increasing fear works. And we've seen some studies on that as well from uh, Breda in 2005 that shows how political ads motivate and persuade voters. Uh, based on emotion, and people uh, people have higher attention for uh, ads that are uh, create more more fear, if you like, and use sort of grainy black and white images versus ads that have a, a lower um, uh, versus ads that use pictures of uh, smiling children, if you like, in front of uh, flags and you know all of that kind of good stuff. So people's attention is drawn to the the more negative ads in the in the first place. So okay, some thoughts on how um, how folks might or how society might begin tackling the problem. One of the things, and we saw the the effect of uh, cognitive biases in the EU referendum uh, research that we, we've done, and uh, that research we're going to be talking about at the International uh, Conference on Political Psychology in October. And have teamed up with some researchers at Missouri State to uh, to to help us tackle the uh, the challenge of uh, uh, extremely non-normal data. Uh, but one of the one of the ways we can tackle this is, uh, or, or tackle the effect of cognitive biases, is, is perhaps adopt a method that uh, this lady here, Jane Elliott, had used. And if you're not familiar with Jane Elliott's work, she basically splits um, participants. It was children in a classroom, but she's done this with other group into people with blue or brown eyes, uh, and uses that as the basis for helping educate about racism and the effects of racism and kind of how that works. So it's possible that you could do something similar with, in relation to, uh, to cognitive biases to make people aware of that, um, which would have benefits outside of the political campaigns to, to prevent people getting hustled at uh, car dealerships and stuff like that. The other thing we noticed is that levels of numeracy were right, really shockingly poor in the UK, and I don't think the, UK, uh, the US is a great deal better. Um, so increasing people's numerical literacy skills as being able to determine that 1,000% APR is a bad deal on a credit card. Um, but it also has effects quite, um, it also has effects in people choosing like medical options and whatnot as, as well. So there's a lot of research actually in that area of literacy, risk literacy in like making medical based uh, choices. So that needs increasing I think uh, all around as well in addition to the, the biases. And the next thing, which I, I think is going to be a lot harder to achieve, because literally anyone can do this. If you've got big pockets, you're going to get a, you know, a lot more traction, is really start enforcing or, or going after people who are um, abusing this sort, of, uh, this sort of political advertising. So that wraps up the, uh, the, the presentation. I'm sure folks will have uh, questions. You can reach me at uh, chris at onlineprivacyfoundation.org. Um, I'm happy to address questions afterwards, but we'll have to go outside somewhere, I think, and I'll leave some, uh, some, some cards on the table if folks have questions. All right? Thanks very much.